So Dominic, you've written two fantastic articles in the Times, one about hypersonic missiles and then one about hypersonic transport. But first, I think it's good to lay out what exactly, what is hypersonic anything? Yeah, hypersonic is a term that's sort of loosely used to mean anything that, or any vehicle that travels at Mark 5, so five times the speed of sound or more. Um, it's not a mathematical term or anything. It's just a, a term that's used around the aerospace industry as opposed to supersonic, which means anything more than Mark 1. So uh, from Mark 1 up to Mark 5, you're traveling at supersonic speeds like you used to be able to do in Concorde. Uh, and above Mark 5, you're traveling at hypersonic speeds. There's nothing around at the moment, passenger transport-wise anyway, that can travel at Mark 5. Um, Concorde has retired, of course. But people have traveled at Mark 5. Um, in the 1960s, the US uh, had the, the X-15, a rocket-powered plane which made more than 100 flights, uh, most of which were hypersonic, and it, and it still holds the record for a powered hypersonic flight, Mark 6.7 in, in 1960. Seven, I want to say. I think it was 1967. And then uh, the space shuttle, the US space shuttle, when it returned to Earth, it was traveling at hypersonic speeds. It went from about Mark 25 in orbit all the way down to a, to a landing speed uh, at Edwards Air Force Base. And, and most of the time it was in the atmosphere, it was at, at hypersonic speeds. So uh, the dream has always been to perhaps get to, to be able to make something that would be able to be reliably used, like Concorde was, or like modern aircraft are, or like modern weapons are that is a that's able to travel at hypersonic speeds because it gives you all kinds of uh, advantages not just in travel time but in military terms as well mm. and i wanted to look at the weapons side of things first um so the ministry of defense is set to speed up the acquisitions of these hypersonic missiles does that make sense for the british military at the moment when when the British military is said to be in kind of a, this dire state, why invest in that weapon specifically? Well, militaries, all, it's not just the British military, militaries all around the world are looking at hypersonic vehicles of one kind or another. It may be a missile of some kind, it may be about strike, or it might be about reconnaissance, uh, or it might be about uh, um, survivability over an enemy target, this kind of thing. It's very hard to shoot something down that's traveling that fast. Very hard even to track it, actually. Uh, so, so, so for example, the US is, is looking very carefully at hypersonics because it's thinking about the threat posed by China. That means a war in the Pacific where hypersonic speed would be an, an enormous asset for any, for any kind of military vehicle, whether it's a missile or a, or a fighter, manned fighter, probably not a manned fighter, but a drone, whatever. Um, the, US, the UK Ministry of Defence has been looking at this for a long time, um, and it has a long history of looking at types of what might be hypersonic vehicles. And a couple of years ago, it signed a memorandum of understanding with a company in Oxfordshire called Reaction Engines, which dates back to the 1980s when the, when, when the UK had a plan for a space plane that would be hypersonic, a single stage to orbit space plane called HOTOL. And HOTOL at the time was the next great thing for British industry. and It was going to be fantastic, but it was quietly shelved in 1989 when it was you know, basically decided that we couldn't afford it. Uh, but a, a company was spun out of that called Reaction Engines, and Reaction Engines has been working away at this kind of technology ever since. And the Ministry of Defence has a, has a joint has a an MOU and a memorandum of understanding with uh, with Reaction Engines. And a couple of weeks ago, they put out a, a an early notice to the industry saying, "Listen, we're looking to go faster on this. <laughs> um, no pun intended. We want to we want to we want to get hypersonic missiles more quickly." Could you come to an industry day sometime in July? So it'll be, uh, so, excuse me, sometime this summer, so sometime in the next couple of months, to talk about what you might be able to do for us, and we'll talk to you about our plans. Now, they're not saying much about the plans because they're, they're basically classified, but the idea would be to build some kind of hypersonic strike capability. Now, uh, the war in Ukraine has, has really focused minds on this because uh, the Chinese and the Russians, for the Russians in particular, say they have hypersonic capability, and and the Russians do in a sense, but it's a it's a kind of a dumb hypersonic capability. It's a rocket powered missile that achieves hypersonic speed and then glides to its target. Um, now that has been around ever since the ballistic missile was first invented in the 1950s. You know the Cold War ballistic missiles, which are still around today, they travel at hypersonic speeds when they re-enter the atmosphere. So it's not that groundbreaking having a missile like that. What the UK would really like and what Western Air Forces would really like, any Air Force would really like, is a more conventional powered vehicle that you can use and then reuse 
uh, at hypersonic speeds. Mm. So Dominic, you said there that the China and Russia have these, or they say they have these weapons. There's questions about how um, effective they are compared to the new technology. But you did say that because of the speed by which they travel, they could, like, you might not be able to see them very easily. If they're flying over a country, they may be undetected. Is there a worry that we could have something like something like the Chinese spy balloon again, where, I mean, we know that everyone spies on each other, but is there a worry that that could just increase? With well, they, I, I think I, I probably slightly misspoke. They, they definitely could track a hypersonic vehicle because, of course, they were able to track the, the space shuttle and, and the Bell X-15. <laughs> but doing something about it once you've seen it is another thing. You'd have to have a missile capable, if you wanted to shoot it down, for example, you have to have a missile capable of catching up with it. Um, so in terms of its, the vehicle's survivability, if it was traveling at Mark 5 and above, it would be pretty safe from most things, and it would be very, very high up as well. So let's move on to hypersonic transport specifically. So you're you're saying that you know we're seeing these in planes and in other kind of vehicles um, used by the military, but actually there could be commercial bodies that are looking to use these for transport. How likely are we like to see that in our lifetimes? Well, I suppose it depends how long we live, but I don't I, I don't think I'm going to be saving up for a ticket. That's for sure. But I think we are at a very interesting point where, rather like nuclear fusion, actually, where it's gone from being something that's preserved of governments to being, in part, the you know the, the 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 territory of the private sector. So there's a whole bunch of companies, right around the world, quite a few of them actually, who've started up and lo- and and raised money, often from uh, tech billionaires. So, for example, Sam Altman, the guy who founded ChatGPT. He led a funding round for a company called Hermaeus, which is one of the leading lights, um, one of the leading pretenders to hypersonic flight uh, in the US. And, and there's a, there's one called Destinus in Europe. There's reaction engines we talked about here in here in the UK. And all these companies uh, think that the military interest in hypersonics is going to be the springboard to some kind of commercial interest, some kind of civilian use. Uh, and and they point to the fact that military spending and military desire has always been the next big thing when it came to aerospace moving. First of all, the invention of the aircraft was was highly spurred by, or at least the, not the invention, but the widespread adoption was driven by military use. Then the move from um, piston engine planes to, to jet aircraft uh, around the second world, the time of the Second World War and thereafter, all driven by military, uh, military desires, military um, uh, financial muscle, actually. So they think that this military interest in hypersonics will be will be the the launching pad for some kind of civilian hypersonics. There are extensive, huge technical obstacles to be overcome, um, of which to name but two. First is is heat. When you're travelling that fast, the, the the vehicle gets very hot. And if you look at the original, the old um, uh, newsreel footage of the Bell X-15, the skin of the aircraft was was ripped to pieces every time it landed, it was in a really bad state. Uh, the space shuttle, of course, had a very special uh, thermal shield. Uh, it failed once and uh, to, 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 with fatal consequences. And you'd have to find some kind of material or some way of cooling a material that would allow um, that would allow the, the aircraft to function and not just melt, basically, and certainly not melt its engine components as well. Um, the second, which is a, the second uh, problem, which is, a, which is a more tricky, maybe not a more tricky problem, but a more subtle problem, is that the way these companies are normally approaching it is by having an ordinary kind of jet engine to accelerate you to supersonic speed, say Mark II, Mark II and a bit, and then a different kind of engine called a ramjet, or in some cases a scramjet, which uses atmospheric air, uh, and, then it, and then it's burnt with a, with a, a thing like a aviation gas or perhaps hydrogen to provide extra thrust, kind of like a bit like an afterburner on, on Concorde. It, to, to do that transition is very tricky because the ordinary jet can't get you quite fast enough to where the scramjet works well. You've got this gap, and it's very difficult to bridge that gap because the, the first kind of engine doesn't work well at high speed, and the second kind of engine doesn't work well at low speed, and how you get over that hump is, is going to be one of the big things. So materials, um, uh, propulsion, and general you know logistical oper- the logistics of the operation are, are huge technical obstacles. But it is interesting we're moving to this phase now where it's attracting lots of private money. Mm. And thinking about private money, I mean, 
I'm assuming from your accent, you're Australian or Kiwi? From New Zealand, yes. New Zealand. I'm American, so we're both really used to those long haul flights from the US trying to get home and see family. And it would be great for so many people that want to see people from, you know, very far away for loved ones wanting to be able to see their family. But do you think that maybe the way that they'll do these flights is a bit like the trips to space that, you know, Bezos and Branson are doing that'll cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a ticket? Or could we see this truly be commercial? I think if it's if it is going to be like the space tourism type ticket price, the two hundred fifty thousand dollar ticket, then it's not going to be a widespread adoption. the 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 amount of money you need to 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 invest to 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 make these things work. These are not relatively simple rocket powered vehicles. These are these are brand new things which will cost tens of billion dollars to to think to to invest. And the companies who are doing this kind of thing are look at it as like a business class type fare. So you'd fly London, New York for say five, six thousand pounds, but you'd do it in ninety minutes rather than rather than six six or seven hours or or three hours on Concorde. Um, but it it could be absolutely transformative for long haul flying. So London, Singapore, thirteen, fourteen hours on a good day uh, uh, on an ordinary subsonic passenger transport. If you if you were able to fly at hypersonic speed, you'd do it in three three and a quarter, three and a half hours. Um, you wouldn't be able to fly the normal route round over Iraq, India, and, and down and down uh, over the Indian Ocean. You'd, because of the sonic boom as things stand, you'd have to fly up over the pole and back down the Bering Strait to uh, to Singapore. Go go that way, over the Pacific. Go that way around. Even so, even if you were travelling a bit further, you'd still do it in about a quarter of the time. So, you know, if if you could say that I could get to New Zealand in six hours, changing at Singapore briefly, uh, then I'd probably be there most weekends. I think. And is there a danger, though? I mean, what do we know about the emissions that could come from these planes? I mean, we already see a lot of celebrities using private airplanes, and I think there's some flight trackers that show the amount of flights they take for really short distances. Um, I mean, is this a danger that that could maybe just kind of increase the amount of emissions that we have from air travel? Well, if if, if hypersonic travel was... was um if it becomes a reality, then it it will emit CO two. <laughs> there's, no, there's no doubt. You know, you can't you can't avoid that. It also emitted at very high altitudes. So there's a I think there's a wider question about the sustainability of aviation as a whole. Some of the startups are talking about using hydrogen, which doesn't produce CO two when it burns. It just produces uh, water vapor. So so you might argue that if the hydrogen economy does become widely spread which some people think is the is one of the you know future energy pathways for the world then actually uh, that kind of hydrogen burning hypersonic aircraft or hydrogen burning aircraft per se would be a way forward lots of aerospace people think that hydrogen actually is not that well suited um, to commercial aviation at least in subsonic commercial aviation uh, but Airbus and Boeing are both working on it there's also this idea of sustainable aviation fuels. Um, I should probably be making the the rabbit ears sustainable uh, because it, it's really it's a it's a term used to describe anything not derived any kind of hydrocarbon that doesn't come out of the ground really. So recycled cooking oil or plant based things. Now I'm sure you know, you're well aware of all the debates about how really sustainable those alternative sources of hydrocarbons are. They still produce CO2 and they're burnt. So so you know just exactly how sustainable they are. It remains to be seen, but I think the separating out hypersonics from the rest of aviation when it comes to talking about CO two imprint, it's it's all one and the same. Really.